Hey there gamers, I'm Pruitt, this is Jim Davis, and on today's WebDM we are talking Call of Cthulhu, E-I-E-I -E Cthulhu Flagen Faglui Maglywin Cthulhu Riley Maganagil Fagolgan. We are here at Tribe Comics and Games in beautiful Austin, Texas, so let's get to it. <laughs> Let's chat some Call of Cthulhu. Call let's, of Cthulhu, Let's yeah. get Eldritch with this shit. Let's get Eldritch with it. It's a game that I've always been aware of, familiar with H.P. Lovecraft's writings and sort of the mythos that the game draws inspiration from, but the game itself feels like one of those games that all of a sudden everyone's playing. And maybe it's yes. just the circles that I'm in on social media and, and streaming and everything that it seemed that Call of Cthulhu seems very popular right now. Yeah. But it does seem to have a, a moment, as mm -hmm. it were, uh, right now. And, and so I think maybe it's worth uh, worth talking a bit about both in inspiration as well as the game uh, game itself. Exactly. So let's let's start with the inspiration for sure. Call of Cthulhu. It's a genre of kind of cosmic horror. If you're not like getting into the stories, can seem sort of hokey or bizarre, like what's the deal with all these tentacles and, and people going insane. Maybe yeah. you're just familiar with like the tropes of, of mythos horror yeah. and not necessarily having read any of the books before. And so by way of a bit of historical context, these stories are written around a time where there's tremendous advancements in science and our understanding of the universe has expanded, but it's still very limited. Mm -hmm. But we're starting to understand, and, and Lovecraft is grappling with, playing around with the insignificance of humanity in the cosmos. That yeah. up until now, most of human thought had placed humanity at the center of things. Humanity is important, whether that's for spiritual reasons, religious reasons, just sort of cultural reasons. Humanity is the center of its universe. But as we understand more about it, we realize that the universe is this cold, un caring place when humanity may or may not be an accident yeah. and, and is not special in any sense. And grappling with that is part of what makes Lovecraft writing fun. Yeah. To me, at least, right? Like, an understanding that this is about a cosmic horror, an uncaring universe, except Lovecraft has filled his uncaring universe with entities that, at best, just don't you know, humanity is beneath the notice of these creatures in the same way that insects are beneath the notice of your day-to-day -day life. You don't look at the ants crawling on the sidewalk as you walk over it. Right, or they are actively, like, seeking the harm and destruction of humanity itself, whether that's because the Earth is its ancient uh, home of some mm -hmm. kind and humanity is this infestation that's cropped up at some point that needs to be cleansed, or humanity is a source of useful followers or dupes that mm -hmm. can do things these larger entities can't do because of some sort of like mystical binding or the laws of, of magic or something. Mm -hmm. Advances in science coupled with this idea that humanity is insignificant that drives a lot of what I like out of Lovecraft's literature. This right, is right. an important time to note that this literature is a product of its time, and its time was incredibly racist. Yes, very and Love much so. <laughs> Lovecraft in particular has a kind of contempt for pretty much anyone who's not a Western European white guy. A typical misanthrope. Sure, and and he's also is a misanthrope, right? Yeah, yeah. He also, there's a, a strong strain of misanthropy and just sort of like det detesting humanity and, and yeah. a contempt for it that comes through in his writings. I don't think that that means you should stay away from them. Obviously, we're doing a show on it. I right. think they're worthwhile to read. I think it's worthwhile to read with that historical context in mind because it helps you understand like, why is this literature scary? Why does it provoke existential dread? And what are the things, what are the fears and concerns and, and, and everything that, that Lovecraft is grappling with? You should be aware of it, because if you're yeah. not, it can be very jarring. <laughs> yeah, because, because I mean, like you were saying, this is like like superstition mm. butting up against the, the ever-expanding knowledge of the universe. Right. And one thing that does come across is like the more you know and more you find out, the more insane you get. Yeah, and that's right? a big theme of Lovecraft is that knowledge leads to madness. Yeah. And ignorance is the condition that you want to be in. If you're if you're living in Lovecraft's world, then ignorance is it's not bliss. just bliss, it's survival. Right. Because the cold hard truth of Lovecraft's world is that humanity is doomed. Mm -hmm. Humanity is will one day be wiped off the face of the earth and its accomplishments rendered into dust. 
because of these creatures and beings that exist. It's apocalyptic in that sense, in the sense that your efforts and the efforts of humanity and everything else are, are futile in the face of these eldritch beings, these elder gods, these cosmic horrors. First off, that kind of pessimism, that kind of just like futility isn't for everybody. Right. right? There are a lot of gamers out there who like, uh, you know, they want to overcome evil. They want to triumph and they want to be the good guys who are, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, they've thwarted the bad guy's evil plot, they've saved the day, they've got the girl or the boy of their dreams or whoever it is, they've mm -hmm. got the money, they've got the power, and everything's great. Cthulhu is not that. You do not play a character in Cthulhu because you want to see them safe and whole. You no. don't, you don't, <laughs> you don't engage in this kind of role playing because you want to keep your character safe. Yeah. You engage in this kind of role playing because you want to experience the kind of existential dread, you want to deal with these cosmic horrors, and you want to like look at some of the other themes and play around with some of those other themes um, at, in a role playing setting. One of those being knowledge is madness and the implications of what uncovering forbidden knowledge are. So Cthulhu games typically feature insanity or you know the, the dealing with the effects of insanity as your character just like grapples with the oh, it, it, strangeness around I them. mean it's in the forefront I would say having played it for a while now that's the one that's one of the biggest roles you make because every new cosmic horror mm -hmm. I'm gonna need an insanity check. You need an insanity check. Oh, you looked at something you weren't supposed to. You mm -hmm. read something you weren't supposed to, and it's in it's present in the stories as well, right? Yeah. Like there's all constant stories, and my my favorite is the case of Charles Dexter Ward. It's a longer one, but it involves this sort of boy who's being tormented by an ancestor who may or may not be some kind of necromancer projecting themselves forward in time and it's just like really interesting and and it's because it's a longer sort of novella length mm -hmm. you get a bit more of that as opposed to um, as opposed to some of the shorter ones but even just like Call of Cthulhu the short story yeah is worth a read um, and as well as many others Shadows of Rinsmouth is another uh, really good one but mm -hmm. going back to insanity I started I cut my teeth on Warhammer and Warhammer features in Insanity fairly heavily. Yeah. You're either going to get a limb cut off or you're going to go insane in yeah. Warhammer. And it's much the same way in Cthulhu. You're going to either die or be rendered so insane that your character has to be retired. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, I, I have a few stories about that um, that we'll get to. Bringing up Warhammer, uh, having played, there are a lot of similarities right. in the style of game yeah. between Call of Cthulhu and Warhammer. And in some ways, like Warhammer is like Call of Cthulhu in the Renaissance and early modern era. And right. there's a, a style of, of Cthulhu that's Dark Ages Cthulhu. They've got all kinds of Cthulhu. Victorian Atomic Cthulhu, Age. Atomic Age Cthulhu, Cthulhu during the French Revolution. Cthulhu during the expansion uh, westward. Yeah, the Trail of whatever. Trail of Cthulhu, I think, is, is what that one's called. Yeah. But there's a lot of crossover between mm -hmm. Cthulhu and Warhammer. And I think that's an asset because the mythos is one of those, I don't know what you want to call it, idea pools mm -hmm. that touches on a lot of shores. Yeah. Right? There's Cthulhu stuff in Conan. Right, and Conan is, is battling eldritch horrors and the sorcerers in, of the Hyborian Age are, are calling forth these things and Conan has to heft his sword and, and don his armor and go to battle against them. And that's a different style, right? And that's one in which these cosmic horrors are overcome by, by manly virtue and martial prowess. Right. Kind of thing. And then there's others where it's like the classic 1920s, 1930s Cthulhu where it's investigators who are sort of like pick apart this mystery and in the course of picking apart this mystery, uncover a vast conspiracy of some kind that mm -hmm. usually involves a big cosmic horror or something like yeah, that. Yeah, somebody bring back Abhoth or any of the other Narlathotep or something like yeah, that. One yeah, of the, any one of the other great old ones. Re returning a bit to some of the themes that we're talking about in, in Cthulhu Gaming, we've got Knowledge is Madness, but another one is like beings either not meant for the world or are the true masters of the world. Right. And so you might have beings that are like, their, their physical properties are not meant to exist in this reality. That's kind of the Warhammer take on it, right? Yeah. Like the, the chaos entities are like beyond this reality and when they enter it, it, it tears at the fabric of it. They look different or they, they behave differently or something. But then you have those, uh, those entities in Cthulhu where it's kind of like, well, what is Cthulhu doing sleeping under the Pacific? Why is his city 
on Earth. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking like, well, that's because Earth really belongs to the great old ones, right? Earth really does belong to these cosmic horrors and humanity is a is an infest, of, uh, they're the, the louse, <laughs> bed lice. Yeah, yeah while, while, <laughs> while they were sleeping on their bed, they got lice. Right, they got and bed so bugs. So as soon as they wake up, Right, but even Cthulhu can be brought low by an atomic bomb. And that, that doesn't even cover all of the stuff like Migo and the other sort of uh, being the great race of Yith. There's all these sort of like cosmic beings that are like, yeah, we fly physically through space on wings using sonic and psionic and, and whatever sort of, we project our thoughts and capture someone and put their brain in a jar and take it with us to our alien planet. There's aliens and alien cultures and alien creatures coming to Earth to experiment, to set up colonies, to take prisoners or, or subjects for it and flying through space, back through space. So you can use these in say a Dungeons and Dragons game I mean, obviously something like the Illithid or the Abolith oh, yeah. make good sort of Cthulhu stand-ins, but you could just easily drop Amigo in there and have it just be like, oh, what in the hell is this thing yeah. that we're fighting? Um, I don't know, I, I, that's, that's kind of, I, the creatures in Cthulhu are, are, one of the, are a big draw for me because they're not your standard monsters. And a lot of them are like, you don't want to tangle with these creatures, they will mess you up. Or they're just creepy. Right. Uh, Will has a tendency to, to bring about uh, fish babies, <laughs> like fish <laughs> with baby faces right. that make these loud sucking noises as they claw, like clamor up on land like and come kips. at you. Yeah, like mud kips with baby like faces. Hang but on. Like, I had to pass the sanity yeah, roll. Yeah, okay, I'm okay, good. Okay, now I'm you're good. good. You know, Cthulhu sleeps in his city. Mm -hmm. And that highlights a, a third theme of Cthulhu that I, that I really like, and that is the fact that ancient history is important. Yeah. It's not just ancient history that happened a long time ago. The investigators will be delving into ancient mysteries. And oh, in yeah. many ways, in, in the Cthulhu myth mythos, humanity of the past had a better understanding of the world. They understood, right. they had a better understanding of their place on it, who the true masters of reality were. And there's this kind of idea that superstition and ignorance and dark enlightenment, you know, unenlightening yourself is the only way to survive this horror that's going to come at you. Mm -hmm. And in, in that respect, the ancient peoples of the world, uh, what they thought, how, what they did, whether it's the writing of books like the Necronomicon or the crafting of certain magics and spells that they got from these cosmic beings that they then pass on to modern man, there's this idea that like ancient history is important and should be paid attention to. And yeah. it's going to be feature heavily in some Call of Cthulhu games as part of that investigation uh, that goes on. I love myths about our past, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I'm a sucker for ancient aliens stuff. You know, I don't believe any of it, but I like the story of it. Yeah. And I like stories of Atlantis and ancient Lemuria and, and bygone Hyperborea. And you can draw on those kind of like pre, ancient, just like what in the hell? Pre-rational history? Pre-rational history is a good way to think yeah. about it. And you can draw on that as inspiration for your Call of Cthulhu games or if you want to slap a dash of, uh, of Call of Cthulhu in another kind of game. Um, the fourth sort of big theme that I see in Call of Cthulhu is magic as a corrupting force. Mm -hmm. Magic is not something that you want to engage in. It's also, if I'm, I, if I'm not mistaken, something that almost anyone, if you have the spell, can attempt to cast. So it's- Anyone. It's, it's accessible to anyone, but there is a cost associated with it, unintended yep. consequences, and very often the effects of the magic are one of those things that's like, this is unpleasant or not desirable. Mm -hmm. And you turn to magic either because you're desperate or it's the only way you can defeat one of these entities yeah. or you are yourself insane and think you can master these forces when in reality, it, you know, you're, you're not. It's, that's not what's gonna happen. No, no, normally these tools are out there and, and you're what's being used for its power to be released. Right, like right You aren't right. in control of this. You're yeah. the battery. Yes, you're the, you're the catalyst that yeah. unleashes this magical force that otherwise you would want dormant or, yeah. uh, we are back to knowledge is madness. Knowledge is not, yeah. in, knowledge is not freeing. It's not good. Please keep that book closed. Don't yes. uncover that thing. Yeah, don't read the Necronomicon multiple times because uh, your guy could die from it. Uh, no. I know that from experience. Sound like personal experience. Personal experience there. here, personal because experience. like you were saying, there's a cost to, to any kind of 
spell casting or using those abilities and that costs us sanity. Right. That's, that's probably like your most important uh, aspect of your character right. in right. Call of Cthulhu. Right. I've never actually had the opportunity to play a mm -hmm. game of Call of Cthulhu. Yeah. My knowledge of it comes from reading the stories and sort of just being aware of the themes that go into Cthulhu gaming. You, however, for the last couple months have been like deep into several different Call of Cthulhu games through Encounter RP, right? Yeah, on, over on Encounter RP, uh, I'm play, I, I came in halfway through Mask of Nero Thotep. Yeah. Uh, we finished that out. Uh, I believe only one PC made it out alive. Okay. Yeah. I think. That sounds right, about right. from what I've heard. <laughs> well, I mean, we had to sacrifice ourselves in order to save the world. We were trying to divert a comet. And yeah. the comet was literally coming for us. Right. Us, like tracking us. So we, we went across the stars into basically Carcosa. Uh-huh. And guess what? Comet changed paths oh, yeah, and went yeah. over there like Thor's hammer or some shit. Nice. Uh, but <laughs> we had to leave. We had to leave a bunch of people behind. It is a. It's you know you have your characteristics. You know your strength. You have your constitution, um, size, dexterity. You have appearance. Yeah. Intelligence, power, which is how you roll abilities or like you your know, magic spells, power, magic think, power, sure. uh, and then education. And so that's you can have intelligence and then you have education. So it's right. split up between intelligence and wisdom a little bit differently. I see that, yeah, right? yeah, that makes sense. But what I do love that they added is you have your normal values for your roles, right. but then they also have half values and fifth values. Uh, and what that does is let you, okay, oh, I have a 60 in strength and I want to open this door. Yeah. Well, you roll 59, okay, you got a success. Right, right, well, right. Well, guess what? If you roll uh, 29, well, that's, a, that's like a good success. You, right, you, you right, got right. less than half. If you get less than a fifth, I mean, you fucking rip the door off the hinges. I right, mean, right, it gives right. you, it's already baked in to give you better outcomes outcomes for gotcha. anything you're trying gotcha. to do. It's a roll under percentile system. Right. And it's got these sort of benchmarks like you're saying, like half your skill and then a fifth of your skill mm -hmm. that that sort of perform the way, if, if our viewers are familiar with say uh, Warhammer or any of the, the other sort of percentile systems that use degrees of success right. for opposed roles, it's kind of like that. So that it's not a binary, like say Dungeons and Dragons is, where it's like AC 16, 16 and above hits, 15 and below misses. Right. You can get, uh, not standing crits and fumbles, but you can get uh, a bit more nuance to the outcome of the die roll there. And based off those characteristics, you can create a few more uh, characteristics that are important to your player. And the two biggest ones are going to be luck uh -huh. and they're going to be sanity. Right. Luck is luck. This is when you're like, well, I want to look around and see if I can find a, a flashlight. Yeah. Right, give me a luck roll. Yeah, yeah. If you fail that, no, there's no flashlight. Yeah. You know, if you do a hard success... Okay, you find five flashlights. Right, right, right. right. Flashlight with full batteries. With full batteries. Fresh bulb. <laughs> but, but then you have to start thinking long term with your luck because you might start out with a luck of 60. Yeah. Well, you start rolling and you really need to hide from whatever this horror that's tracking you. So you're trying to hide and your skill is like 60 and you roll a 62. Well, yeah. guess what? You can now spend some of your luck gotcha. permanently. Permanently. To get to bump that 62 down to a 60, and now Just you have a success. Now but you got to think about that. Well, it, you're, you're literally, your luck is running out. The minute you start your character, right? Mm -hmm. Like, your luck is slowly draining. And as I understand, insanity, it's similar. You it's similar. start with some, and then it just Slow, slowly there, decreases. It is insanely hard, ironically, to get insanity back. Yeah. Like, like there are very few things, like you literally have to go take a vacation. Right, right, right. And yeah. you can get some sanity back, but yeah. very little. But same thing, you see a cosmic horror. Like it starts out with normal stuff. Like you might see a body eviscerated, yeah. right? And you're playing a reporter and yeah. maybe you've never seen that. Well, you gotta make a sanity roll. Otherwise yeah. you might, you might, you know, you've seen some shit now. What you then have to worry about though, is how much sanity you lose. Right. Because if you lose X amount in one go, like you lose like five or six or more, you'll gain a temporary insanity. Gotcha. It might be like uh, agoraphobia uh -huh. or uh -huh. or just fear of people. And like all of a sudden you just have to go hide in a closet for two hours and yeah. just hug your knees and, and rock back and forth because that's how you make it through. Brings up a point that I that I really like about Cthulhu and, and games in the style of Call of Cthulhu is that mm -hmm. you're playing regular people. Dungeons and Dragons has is will always be near and dear to my heart. But right. one of the things that I get weary of with Dungeons and Dragons is starting as a hero and then only getting better. Yeah, you become a better hero. You become a oh, better yeah. hero. But but com compared to say the average villager, a first level Dungeons and Dragons character is already heroic. 
Yes. Right. And so I like games where you just play regular people. Yep. And and Call of Cthulhu, you're playing regular people in the real world. Mm -hmm. So they don't have any frame of reference for the fantastic. They don't have any frame of reference for magic and the supernatural. And particularly mm -hmm. if you're playing like modern yeah. people in a Cthulhu. Yeah. Then it is one of those things where it's like, yeah, well, seeing a body eviscerated by a by a monster and you're just coming across the aftermath mm -hmm. of it, that's trauma inducing. Yeah. And insanity is sort of the characteristic that represents that, yeah. Exactly, or uh, to, to draw upon a uh, pop culture reference, you're gonna go to the first season of True Detective. Like, right. that is Call of Cthulhu. That is a Call of Cthulhu scenario. Yeah. That's all it is, yeah. that's what they're doing. At the end, he looks through the portal into Carcosa. Right. Like, you were literally doing that. So when they find the girl at the very beginning, yeah. guess what, they both made a sanity roll. Russ right. Cole probably didn't actually have to make one. He's a little bit more, he's seen some, he's he's seen seen some, some stuff shit. already, yeah, yeah. But Woody Harrelson's character, yeah. you definitely well, know he. Has to. Yeah, 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 Marty, he lost a couple sanity at that moment. Right. You right. know. Well, they all do, and then he. I, 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 that's a good example, and I, I know that it, you know we often use media as a touchstone for our gaming, and I think it's important to do that because it gives you a frame of reference and it provides dungeon masters mm -hmm. with a framework for thinking about how their games go. And that first season of True Detective is one of those things where it's just like, yeah, that's this is Cthulhu through and through. They're, oh, they're, they're all doing ritual, they're doing ritual killings. Right. Uh, I mean, this has been going on forever. For generations. It's being covered up by... There's a conspiracy, and there's, yeah. there's always some sort of like mundane thing that goes on that covers up the mm -hmm. eldritch horrors that are that are lurking in the shadows there. Also, an, another thing with regards to like your skills, because I mean, there is a skill system right. that is based off of your characteristics. Usually there's a base number, and then you add your characteristic to that number. Sure, okay. Right? So uh, so some can start off better than others. Like if you were to fail a roll, like you're trying to climb a tree to get up to whatever and you fail that roll and you and it's you failed it by like fifteen. You're not gonna spend fifteen. You're not gonna luck, spend fifteen luck. That's right? a lot That's of just luck. insane. <laughs> but what you can do is you'd be like, oh wait, maybe I have like a knife to, to help me climb. I'm gonna whip that out right quick as I fail this, and you can do something called pushing a roll. Yeah. If you can come up with a reason to to beseech your keeper yeah. to give you another chance. Yeah. You can do that if gotcha. it's good enough. And gotcha. so you can roll again. But guess what? Hmm. If you fail that second roll... It's catastrophic. It's catastrophic. Gotcha. Like, no, it's like, if you fail that second roll, even by one, you know, a couple of points, yeah. that is the same as in D&D &D rolling a crit fail. Gotcha. Like, something bad's going to happen. Gotcha. So there's a bit of a risk-reward there, yeah. and, it, and it gives players the option where it's like, oh, yeah, I failed a critical roll. Mm -hmm. not, a, not a critical, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You failed a roll that was critical. And you rolled a nine. Yeah. You needed to, you need that to pass. You, you now have a chance to, like, like you're saying, bargain with the keeper, who is the the game master of the game, and try to gain it back. But then you're also tempting fate, pushing your luck yeah. rather. Yeah. Uh, and I that's I think what I love the most about that style of gaming is that tempting fate, pushing mm -hmm. your luck, because the system is rather deadly. Yes. Like you're regular people, and regular people suffer injuries it, it's, fairly easily. It, it's again, it's mu much like Warhammer. If you want a comparison as far as like hit points or health or whatever, like first season I played, I was playing a, a Texas. Ranger. So he's a character that was kind of bulky. He's, he's 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 substantial. He's healthy. Yeah, he had 14 wounds. He had 14 right. hit points. Health, yeah. right? Yeah. And that was it. Guess what? If you shoot a gun, a gun does 1d10 plus 2. And you can shoot it two or three times. Right. So do the math. Right. You get in a shootout and you it's get really shot, you're probably going to die. Right. It's probably going to be bad. That highlights a lot about uh, running games in Call of Cthulhu that, you know, if you're used to Dungeons and Dragons, you know, as an aside, I, I think people, if you're a fan of role-playing games, you should play as many as you can. Yes. But playing a game that's as different from Dungeons and Dragons like Call of Cthulhu, playing something like that where your characters are fragile, yeah. both mentally and physically, mm -hmm. and the point of the game isn't to make sure they survive it's to investigate these horse. I mean, the characters are called investigators, right? Yep, they're, that they're, is exactly the, what they're the called. The keeper is running a game for the investigators. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that investigation into it that your your characters becomes like a, a tool or a mouthpiece for exploring this thing. Yeah. But they are going to get roughed up, shredded, yeah. degraded, <laughs> burnt, crispy, chopped up, insane. Yeah. You know, and I, part of that fun of it, at least watching you guys play, is watching the terrible things that are gonna happen to the characters and yet the stakes are so high they can't give up. 
No, you can't because you are literally standing like a bastion against the oncoming insanity of the great old ones. Right. And the fact that you as mortals can actually do something. Yeah. about it. If you find out the right clues and you get yourself in the right spot, right. that's what it's, a, it's, at least the games I've played, has been what it's about. Yeah. You've got to figure out exactly where you need to be at that right moment yeah. to disrupt that ritual, to do that thing, because you can't just go toe-to-toe forever. You like, can't brute force your you, way through. You, you, you can't. My character for the most recent game, or at least my first character. Your first character. Uh, uh, Dr. Alan Pierce, <laughs> who I shamelessly just... He's He was Hawkeye from MASH. Right. Except he was in the First World War. Post-First World War, as opposed to being in Korea. Yeah. And he found the Necronomicon. And I was just like, oh, I'm reading this. Guess what? Uh, after the second time I tried to read it, I went insane. <laughs> like, I got a permanent insanity. I dropped below 20 insan- insanity points. Yeah. And I was permanently insane. Gotcha. And let me tell you, as a role player, that was a particular um, challenge. Yeah. And I loved it. Well, that's that's one of the things that I, I like about, I mean, one of the many things I like about it, and, and because it, it does offer you those moments, mm-hmm. and you don't always get to play characters that are that fragile, that, that you know, um, mm-hmm. I don't know, fragile is a good word for it. You, but the opportunity then to say like, yeah, I've got a ton of these in, insane quirks and, and phobias and, and just baggage yeah. that's weighing me down, it, it gives the role player a chance to like really pull out all the stops mm-hmm. and to play a character that is going through this madness and it's a challenge in that respect. And I, I guess that I, I answered my own question maybe that uh, for the beginning of the show, which is like, maybe that's the popularity of it now. Because it seems like that, that the idea of storytelling, of yes. deep role playing, of, of coming together as a group and playing these characters and, and really inhabiting them yes. seems to be ascendant right now within the hobby. And well, it's one of those things where a game like Call of Cthulhu poses that challenge and says like, you, you're not just playing a, a zero to hero badass yeah. who can solve every problem through a strong sword arm and mighty spells. Yeah. You've got to outthink your opponents. They are always going to be more powerful than you. Mm-hmm. And they have human minions who can kill you with a gun. Um, You've got to be clever, you've yeah. got to be resourceful, and you've got to do it all while navigating the perils <laughs> of having your insanity, having your sanity chipped away yeah. as you uncover cosmic horrors. Uh, yes, because those cosmic horrors could be in the guise of anything, and that's, uh, you know, we, like our show on villains, you know. Right. It could be anything, and all of a sudden it. tentacles bust out, and oh, I need a sanity roll, and oh my God, we just need to run away, right? Right, you should probably just run away. But but what you, what you're discussing? Two dimensional dog that comes out of the shadows in the corner. Yeah, is going to come get us. Yeah, you see a shadow that then pops up into three dimensions. Yeah. oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, but yes, it, it is definitely lends itself more to role playing R O L E, sure, as opposed to uh, would sometimes D and D gets pushed into, which is role playing. Yeah, I mean, where it, you're I, just you're like, oh, I wanted to do that. Let me just check with a roll right quick. Right, right. I right. mean, like we do much less rolling in Call of Cthulhu, yeah. I, I think, than my normal D and D games I play. Yeah, yeah, um, I can see that definitely. And 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 I and I do I, I love that because you know I've been playing for almost twenty years now. Yeah. And you know I've 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 min maxed and power gamed <laughs> and rules <laughs> lawyered the most badasses to. <laughs> carve their their legacy across the sky and, right. and time itself. And maybe now I just want to play a, a doctor. Yeah. And that's what it did. And he was awesome. And he went out in a blaze of glory. Um, yeah. I, that's that's the kind of thing that that I think is, is, is worthwhile in a game like Call of Cthulhu or Warhammer or, or any of the other games where you're dealing with an overwhelming force and you're just a regular person. Mm-hmm. Is that if you've been through the kind of badass D&D campaign, eventually that gets stale. And I feel it myself as a dungeon master because I'm like, oh yeah, I want campaigns where it's it's just like blood and guts gritty. Yeah. You know, and, and the characters just have to claw and scrape for every advancement that they get. And they're set against powerful enemies. I, I mean, ultimately this is why I'm like, oh, I'll just play Warhammer. Um, but that style of gaming is a, re- is a refreshing palate cleanser Mm-hmm. If you've played a lot of 
the style of D and D that's just like gung ho, high octane action movie. Like we're get you know we're gonna shrug off arrows and sword bursts and all that other kind of stuff. Um, that that's maybe a, an antidote. And playing a little bit of Call of Cthulhu get, makes you ready for that D and D campaign that's just like balls to the wall, kick down the door action. Mm -hmm. um, and mixing it up that way is, uh, I mean, I, I think it can only pay good dividends for it. But uh, yep, you gotta draw from all, so all sources. All sources. Mm -hmm. All sources. <laughs> But Lovecraft was another one of those where he was just like a sickly New England boy. And having lived in New England for going on two years now, I can see why people up there are just like bleak as fuck. <laughs> just, I mean, like, it's sometime in November it dipped below 40 and it still hasn't gotten back above 40. It's sleeting. It's this, they're in the middle of an ice storm right now in the middle of April. How's the sun up there? There's no Michigan. sun. I'm about to say in Michigan. There's no sun. 60 days of sunlight. The yeah, there's none. There. You, we have to sit under sun lamps because otherwise you will get seasonal affective disorder. And it's a real thing. Yeah, and there are times when the last, this last winter, I was just like, why am I so fucking mad? You can just like, I am just like, irate. You can come right. McGuilfan.